Bellator's Lightweight Grand Prix kicks off March 10th with Usman Nurmagomedov defending his lightweight title against Benson Henderson in the main event on Showtime. I'm Robin Lundberg, joined now by Bellator analyst Chael Sonnen. Now, Chael, no Habib in the corner uh, for Nurmagomedov, but how much of a difference do you think that actually makes in this fight? I think it matters, and you want to know who's playing that cool is Khabib's guys. I mean, I can go over to Islam Makhlchev, who said, "Oh, it'll be different, you know." But we'll uh, talk to him on Facetime ahead of time. And, and now, uh, you know, I, I got to talk to Nurmagomedov, the champion here. I saw him at the press conference. It was the first time that I met him, but I asked him about that, and this was kind of was a little bit fresher. This was two days before uh, Bader fought Fedor, just for a, a time reference. First time I ever met him, and I asked him, I said, hey man, is this real? Is Khabib really not coming? Is he really not in the practice room with you guys? Did you really not have warning? Did he really just walk away? And he said, yeah, he was very polite. He was very calm about it. He talked about how much the family had showed him, but he also talked about the team and the coaches they have and the structure that they have. And he dismissed it. He dismissed it as he's very respectful. But he said it wasn't going to matter, and I believed him. Uh, you know, from your personal experience, how much do little things like that matter in fights like this? Like, what what are the things that go into your head when you're going out there, or is it really just about your preparation, where you're at physically? Right, and Robin, I, I suppose that would be for each guy. Like, I'll personalize for myself. I thought I was a pretty mentally tough guy. I could get through uh, some different hurdles. But if I didn't have Clayton Hires, if my coach wasn't with me, the guy that convinced me I was good enough to do this, the guy that convinced me I was in shape to do it, the, the guy that got me, I mean, it, that would have been a mess. As a matter of fact, I got confronted with that one time. Clayton couldn't make a fight, and I said, I'm not going to do that. I, and I and I said, you know, you can't be out here the week of. Can you come in the day of? Can I fly you in the day of? And when he found out how important it was, he changed his schedule. He ended up being there. But, I, I mean, I'll just share with you. I, I personalize it. But it, it's a big deal. And now you're talking about family. You're talking about the guy that you look up to, the guy that trained you, but he's also your family. And now he's not going to be there. I think it's a big deal. Looking back really quickly, Chel, uh, I, I know you weren't that impressed by John Jones over the weekend. Why was that? Okay, now I got to be clear on that because John Jones will whip somebody's ass. I mean, this guy is a really special talent. I'm comparing him to John Jones. I think it might have been the clumsiest I've seen John Jones. I think it might have been, you know, the loosest his body looks. And I know we try not to judge too much, but it means something. There's a reason we face these guys off. John Jones is in a weight class. It maybe didn't apply to this opponent, but he's 22 pounds under the limit. I think there was some things to look at. That takedown that he got, nobody was more surprised he got that takedown than him. He's a pretty good wrestler. That was not good wrestling. It just happened to work. So when I'm critical of John, I am doing it by comparing him, in fairness, to his own greatness. Well, Cyril Gaon obviously wasn't in his prime either. Who, who do you think is the right opponent for Jones? I love that they're doing Stipe. I, I mean, I have a little bit of a concern. There's a stat out there, and this line just came out about 20 minutes before you and I started talking, so in case you haven't seen it, but it's three to one. I think three to one's a little bit strong. The person that made the line said that there is a statistic there. There's only been one athlete who's taken a break, who's come back over 40 and won, and it was Randy Couture. Now, I have not confirmed that. I'm repeating for you what I just read, and they're, of course, talking about Stipe being removed from the sport for a period of time. It'll be about a year and a half when he gets in there and uh, being north of 40. Look, I think MMA math works. People like to say it doesn't. I think it does. Daniel Cormier is a common opponent, and Daniel Cormier said Stipe can go with him and he said Stipe can even beat him. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, another big fighter, Francis Ngannou, Dana White said won't be returning to the UFC. So what's next for him? Could he be a Bellator guy? Yeah, I would love to hear what you think about that because when Dana said that, that did not sound like a negotiation. We see that back and forth through the media. That That is not what that sounded like. That sounded like as that book is closed. That sounded like if Francis calls and says, you know what, I rethought it. They're going to say, Goodbye, it's too late. That's that's how I interpret it. Now, things change quickly. When you ask, could he go to Bellator? I think that one thing that has to be in place for Francis's next fight is a pay-per-view mechanism. Scott Coker has done that before. The PFL started to have rumor of really having some legs to this because they announced a pay-per-view arm, but I, I don't know that that's really been activated. And I think it's one of the reasons that Francis is looking at boxing. And that wanted to eliminate Scott Coker because Scott Coker will promote boxing events. He's already spoke about that. Will it be Bellator specifically or will it be a Showtime product? A little bit of a different question. You know, what about something like the WWE for Francis? Sure. 
I don't I, I don't think that that's out, out of the cards. If he wanted to do something like that, if he could get that attention, look, I think he had a massive opportunity. I don't like how he played it. I, I think that it's very risky. But I don't know that I'm right. I won't I won't be right for two years. In two years, it's gonna be a hindsight issue. Did this work out? And Francis had reason to believe that Tyson Fury was going to go and do something real special with him in England. Tyson had him brought over. Tyson put him in the ring in front of 93,000 people that were on their feet cheering. There was a good reason that Francis thought he needed to take this risk. But it looks as though Tyson Fury was more interested in fighting the UFC heavyweight champion than he was Francis specifically. And it looks like maybe that ship has sailed. Now, I understand that you once had a, a flirtation with the, the WWE. What happened there? I, I had a flirtation with professional wrestling. Now, this was in the 90s. And if you'll remember, though, the internet was different. It was hard to reach people. Facebook wasn't a thing. Twitter wasn't a thing. You had to be introduced. Uh, you know, not everybody had cell phones. It was just a very different world. And there was something called the power plant. And it was through WCW, which was a rival of the WWE. And I went out and did that. It was a tryout. It was actually very difficult. Uh, me and one uh, other Jake, uh, uh, gentleman had made it. Um, I was a sophomore in college though, so I, I took it, I went back to college for two years, got my degree, and then I planned to return to WCW, but they'd gone out of business, and I didn't know how to reach anyone at the WWE, I mean, it was just, a, it was a different time, and I didn't, I didn't know who to call. You didn't have a direct line to Vince? No, I didn't, and, and it was like three or four years later, I met Rowdy Roddy Piper. He lives in my hometown, but I had never met him, so... You know, if I would have met him, maybe, maybe I could have known what to do. I didn't know what to do. And I knew Randy Couture, so I went in the direction of MMA. Now, I also saw you had said you um, got $8.8 .8 million for fighting Anderson Silva. Given what Dana White is known to pay fighters, there was some skepticism about that that claim. Um, is, is that, do I have that right? Oh yeah, and that's a scumbag move by me. Like, I did not want to disclose. They kind of brought that out. I mean, I have to say, like, if nobody saw it, like, they kind of brought this out on me and it sounds like you, you you want the real number on that. I just didn't have time to explain what all was in that deal. If I would have had a little bit more time to explain what was in that deal, I did an ultimate fighter. And an ultimate fighter was what was next for me. The Anderson Silva fighter went right into an ultimate fight. So this was all encompassed. And they used to have something known as a locker room bonus back then. And you, you remember hearing about those. And it was very common with Dana, Lorenzo Fertitta. And that was the time that I'm speaking about. So. When I got the call for the locker room bonus, we had also just done a deal with Fox. And Dana said, I can give you a bonus or I can give you a job with Fox, but you only, I'm only giving you one and you need to choose now. And he said, you're better off taking the Fox deal. So I had the fight, but I had a Fox deal and I had an ultimate fighter. And frankly, I wasn't trying to swerve anybody. I didn't have time to explain all of that. All right, well, there you go. You just explained it now. How about uh, Dana's newest venture? As somebody who's, who's um, competed in mixed martial arts, you know how to defend yourself, you know how to, to, to go on offense, but the, this power slap thing, what, what do you make of that? Robert, I'm only guessing by your body language and tone what you think of it, and I think we're probably on the same page. Look, I don't have a lot of hobbies, so I'm very open to being won over by this. I would like to have more things to look forward to. I would like to come on with you and have more things to discuss. The problem that I think they're gonna have with me is convincing me there's a skill when you let somebody hit you. Now, I'm open to it. I haven't missed one. I'm tuning in. I'm I'm open to being won over, but I think that they are gonna have to show me how that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> Obviously, UFC has been, you know, at, at the top, but you, you now have some competition. Where do you see Bellator relative to UFC and the, the landscape as it goes forward? Bellator is crushing it. You know, they've always done a, biz, a, a very different business. I was one of the guys that was able to have a real good relationship. I feel like I could grab my phone for you right now, call Dana, get an answer, or I could call Coker and get an answer. People have asked me because of that relationship. They said, what's the difference between those two? And I can answer the question. When Dana does something, okay, if you're pitching an idea to Dana, the response you want to hear him say is interesting. If you're pitching an idea to Coker, the idea and the response you want to hear from him is fun. And, and that is one of the differences. Scott Coker is looking to have fun. He's looking for things that people want to see. They want to see it right now. It doesn't matter if it's a novelty, if it's the right fight, if it's an eight-man tournament, if he's got to put up a million dollars to make it interesting, he's going to have fun. And I really feel as though Bellator is coming to his own. I got to go to uh, their last, what they call a tentpole event. That was Fedor 
versus Bader. This was absolutely packed and sold out. I have never been to a, a Bellator arena that was that full. I realized there were some special things there. Johnny Eblen also competed. There's a lot going on that night, but uh, they're doing a really neat job. And I personally like the tournament. I like the tournament because we take politics out. I was the guy that manipulated the politics. I could grab a microphone and do more than a guy could do with two or three wins. I don't think it should be that way. Whether I made my living on that or not, I don't think it should be that way. You should live on your skills, but there's not a way to do it unless you have a bracket. So when Scott Coker puts a competitive architecture at like a Grand Prix and the right guy wins, come on, man, we got to appreciate that. You can check it out on Showtime starting March 10th. Chael, appreciate your time.